Originally, I wasn't going to even watch my adventures with Superman. I'm not completely clueless when it comes to Superman, but I don't really have extensive knowledge about Superman, so I just didn't really pay the new show much attention. That is, until a friend of mine decided to watch it and live blog her experience to me via Discord. And so, I found out that, like most people who don't have extensive knowledge about a subject, I had a lot of opinions about it. And that's how we got here to this being a video. As well as the fact that I figured Superman is a bit of an evergreen topic. So even if this specific show I'm focusing on isn't the hottest new thing anymore, Superman himself will always be worth talking about. Not to mention, this new show's executive producer is Josie Campbell, the show creator behind She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, whose final season I still want to make a video on, if only to perform an exorcism to get the demons out of my brain. I'm so proud of you, Katra. And most of the main staff were also brought on from She-Ra. It's also animated by the Korean studio Mur, who has been behind Legend of Korra, Voltron, She-Ra, Harley Quinn, and an upcoming Devil May Cry show? I mean, okay. Which meant that, potentially, a Superman cartoon with these creative leads would make it fit nicely for the kind of content I make, despite not being a superhero-focused channel. And he's like, yeah, did you see, you see Dead Man Walking? Because that was out at the time. And I said, yeah. And he's going, well, look in his eyes in that movie. He's got the eyes of a violent, caged animal, of a fucking killer. <laughs> and I was like, dude, it, it's Superman. I like Superman. That is, I like Superman the character. Despite some people claiming he's boring because he's basically way too OP to be relatable, I actually enjoy this concept of a guy who, despite having powers on par with the Greek god, does not view himself as having any more authority than any other person. He's just a guy who does the best that he can to help others, just like most people. The only difference is he's got a much bigger skill set at his disposal to do the said helping. If I can dig some tunnels off the main core, maybe I can stop the eruption before it starts. But there's something great about that. Just the guy who, sure, technically is an alien chucked at Earth because space Google blew up his planet, but who really is just a human being in every single way that matters. He grew up in small town America with hardworking farmer parents who loved him very much and taught him good values. He's basically a character in a rock wall painting, but like a good rock wall painting. The ones that depict the blue collar hardworking American of the 1950s. Superman believes wholeheartedly that human beings are good, or at the very least, want to be good. And because of that, Superman decides to use his powers to protect humanity, as well as the fact that at his core, he sees himself as being part of the humanity he is protecting. It makes him a genuinely likable character. Of course, some people would gag at just how optimistic or overly saccharine this may come across, and I get that. But that optimism is why I really enjoy him as Batman's best friend, for instance. Because Superman took one look at Bruce and went, oh, this guy needs some kind of grounding or he's gonna go full Howard Hughes. And then Superman proceeded to be 80% supporter friend and 20% annoying nuisance, giving Batman some form of human connection. Okay, sure, the connection is with an alien who has lasers for eyes and can fly, but at least it's something. Superman is a cool character who I really like. He may not have the deep resonating power with me as he has for so many other people, but I like him. The problem is, I don't like the way a lot of current material writes him. <coughs> Two things you should know about me before we go much further. I don't like Frank Miller's characterizations, and I don't like Frank Miller's prose. Oh, you're gonna hurt. You self-righteous, self-possessed, self-absorbed, sack of- Stop it. Cut it with all this crappy schoolyard beating. Go on. Hit me with everything you've got. Bring it on, bat boy. Oh, you're just begging for it, man. You're just begging for it. You think I don't know what you are. You think I don't know how you work. I've got you scanned. I've got you tested. I've got you diagrammed. I've got you down cold. You're out of your mind. Sure, tell yourself I'm crazy. That's what they all say. 
before I hand them their heads. You're crazy if you think you can drop me with electricity. It's just food for me. It can't destroy me. It only makes me stronger. Don't get me wrong, I don't think Frank Miller is a bad writer. Sin City is really good because everything I dislike about Frank Miller's writing style is put into context where it's a strength. That is to say, writing gritty grim dog noir narrations spoken by morally great characters work when you're writing a gritty grim dog noir story. I also think 300 is genuinely very good, and without Ronan, we wouldn't have Samurai Jack or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I also have a friend who assures me that Miller's run on Daredevil is possibly some of his best work. So I don't think Frank Miller is bad at writing comics. I just really hate most of what he's written for Superman and Batman. Mostly because whenever Miller writes Superman, it's either part of a Batman story to prop up Batman as the ideal, mostly because he tends to write Superman as a cop, and when he is tasked to write a Superman-focused story, he finds a way to get Batman involved. Mostly so Batman can complain about how much he hates Superman. I once heard somewhere that Frank Miller legitimately hates Superman, and even more so, hates the idea that Batman and Superman are best friends. Either because he doesn't think it makes sense, or because he resents that some people ship them. Luckily, while looking for confirmation on whether either of these rumors are true, I found someone had actually asked him what he thinks of Superman in a Reddit AMA once. Hey Frank, how do you feel about Superman? People have an idea that you only see him like TDKR portrayed him. Well, you think of the ancient gods, which is really where these characters all come from. It's really strange that a bunch of American Jews imitated a bunch of Greek heroes to create the new superhero. They changed because of the times. Jack Kirby was originally Jacob Kurtzberg, Stan Lee was Stanley Zyber, and Bob Kane, his real given name was Eli Katz. It was part of the anti-Semitism of the time, that people wouldn't get as noticed without all American names, and back then that meant Anglo-Saxon. It meant names like Krypton, or other very Americanized names. Sometimes to the point of absurdity. And so for obvious reasons, namely American anti-Semitism which have been covered up over time, most people don't know that Jack Kirby was fighting the Nazi Bund, for instance. And when World War II came along he was one of the first to go out charging as a 5 foot 4 man with the soul of a warrior, he actually trained to become a boxer before he became a comic book artist. Yeah, he failed but he did become an excellent scout, who would go behind enemy lines. Compare him to Will Eisner, who was the same age, and Will Eisner being a much shrewder businessman and much less of a fanatic on the subject. He went to the military and showed them that he could draw, and had a proposal drawn on a buxom woman putting guns together. So he spent the war as a drawing boy. Keep in mind that Superman was the first of the superheroes, he even predated Batman. He was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster in Ohio, and as time went by they changed Superman accordingly. He started out as a what the Jews call a golem, a product of the Earth who would bring the leaders of warring forces face to face and make them then and there, in the trenches, face each other, and thereby defuse a war that was happening. Along came World War II, everybody was wearing a flag, and Superman hoisted the flag. So that clears that up. But because Frank Miller is Frank Miller, and because Frank Miller wrote The Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One, the fact that I don't like Frank Miller's writing for these characters means that I don't like the current mainstream Superman content. Because for some reason, every person to this point who has gotten the role of directing the course of the DC films, which in turn dictates the mainstream vibe of DC, have looked at Frank Miller's work writing Batman as their inspiration, which in turn set the tone for everything that follows. Not helped by the fact that I have not seen a single film from director Christopher Nolan that I have liked. I can recognize some of them to be great films, but I have never actually enjoyed the experience of watching them. Oh, except Insomnia. Insomnia is really good. And I know there's an easy answer to this problem. See Puff, just read the comics written by other people. And while I fully understand and accept this, 
but I have had some bad luck with superhero comics. I have tried reading what are considered the best stories, but so often run into a problem, which is that I don't think I like the way superhero comics are written. There is the ongoing problem that most people talk about and know about, that most if not all mainline superhero comics require you to do so much extra reading just to get started. You not only need to read the last few issues of whatever storyline you want to pick up to know what's going on, but you also need to read up on several other stories not connected to the main story you are interested in to be able to understand every character who might show up and what they are currently going through. You need so much context just to get started. And I'm sorry, I just don't have the mental capacity nor the ability to sit down and do homework just to read a single story. My brain is too overloaded with pointless Mass Effect lore for me to memorize superhero lore as well. Do Turians hatch from eggs? No, they do not. Turians give live birth. Salarians hatch from eggs. But Turians, despite being birds, uh, they actually give birth to live young. Yes, that is information I just had off the top of my head and didn't have to look up. But there is a bigger problem with superhero comics than no comic I've read having a proper beginning. And that's that most superhero comics also don't have proper endings either. And I understand why. It's so that DC can hook their readership to keep buying the comics. So most mainline stories end with a setup for the next story. But as a result, there's no real closure or satisfying climax to the story you're reading because there can't be a sense of finality as this might affect comic sales. Even with Elseworld stuff like Superman Red Sun, which, to be clear, I really like the concept of, the story still devolves into a very bizarre place where there are threads and concepts which only superhero fans can appreciate. And I don't mean in a fun easter eggs for fans kind of way, but in a the core concept of this character doing this action in an Elseworlds setting will only really be grasped by people who are already deeply entrenched in DC superhero comics. And then the ending just goes completely off the rails for me. Frankly, the only superhero comics I ever seem to end up enjoying are like short one-shots. It makes it very frustrating because on paper I like these characters but so rarely are they presented in a story that I enjoy. And so we come to this cartoon. A cartoon which it seems is more focused on hooking a non-comic book audience as well as giving long-standing Superman fans some new content delivered in a way that hasn't been done as often. Sure, there have been animated versions of Superman before and these animated versions have consistently been the best realization of these characters what would stop you from doing what that Superman did? There's always that kryptonite you carry around. You don't get to joke. Not today. I just took a bullet for you. But the shows have never really been written with an audience in mind who, well, like She-Ra. Also, if you're a hardcore DC comic fan, I apologize in advance for not recognizing certain characters or world details. I'm only mentioning this because even if I try my best to research things, there's going to be details I miss. However, I think in this case that might be a strength, because far too many franchises based on stories in the past few years rely on the audience to do all the heavy lifting in terms of characterization so that they don't have to really write anything. Simply presenting concept and ideas disguised as TV shows so that the audience can do the work of projecting what they know about the characters and the world on the screen and thereby tricking that they are experiencing a well-crafted story. And since I am borderline not equipped with the tools to do the writer's job for them, I can at least try and see how well they, you know, wrote the show rather than being tricked into a headcanon what-if Tumblr post in TV form. We start the show at the Kensis farm, where a young Clark is trying and failing to get his kite out of a tree. It's cute, but I'm not sure why he is jumping at it instead of trying to climb the tree like a normal person would. 
I mean, I know why. It's to communicate to the audience that he can't fly yet because it's relying on you to have meta knowledge of this character for the scene to make sense. But also, I don't know why he's standing underneath it and jumping at it like a particularly stupid cat. It doesn't matter though, because he is a car approaching at a high speed, driven by the most reckless driver I have ever seen since Francis York Morgan. She hits a pothole, causing her to spiral towards a tree. Clark runs towards the car out of instinct to help, which causes his powers to kick in due to his panic, enabling him to not only reach the car, but also be strong enough to stop it before it crashes. The car then mysteriously vanishes as Clark doesn't like go check on the driver or anything, but instead returns to his kite and, this time when he jumps, manages to get high enough to dislodge it only to discover he is now flying. We then have an admittedly very well animated shot of his first flight. Clark manages to calm down long enough to wonder how exactly he's doing any of this, and we get our title. This intro scene is… a little sloppy. It relies on meta-awareness the audience would have coming into it to excuse Clark acting in a way which doesn't make sense within the world. But on the other hand, it's a very good introduction to Clark's personality. His powers are dormant and remain so when he is trying to do something for himself. But when faced with the possibility of someone else getting hurt, without any reason to think he could actually do anything, his panic triggers him to use his powers for the first time. It's clumsy as far as actually making sense goes, but it's very good for character setup, so it depends on your mileage if you want to overlook the awkward parts. I'm sure I'm merely stating this for the intro as an amusing observation and not as some larger setup for the show as a whole or anything. Also, I want to take a moment to appreciate how much I enjoyed Charles Clark's shirt having the universal S on it. We jump forward in time to Clark having moved to Metropolis and living in an apartment with a buddy of his, Jimmy Olsen. Clark accidentally smashes his alarm clock, which I find weird, but okay. And we cut to Lois Lane waking up in her own apartment. All three characters are extremely pumped today. In Clark and Jimmy's case, because today is their first day as interns at the Daily Planet, and in Lois's case, because today is the day she is going to present a story to her boss in the hopes of being promoted from intern to full-fledged journalist. I actually really like the setup of the characters being interns in this version, rather than starting them off as journalists. Not only because it updates Superman, because this isn't the 70s anymore and you can't just get hired by a newspaper company as a journalist or reporter or whatever, but also because it brings our main characters down to a more relatable level for the audience. The target audience for this show would absolutely and fully understand what it's like being in your early to mid 20s and having to work as interns for minimal pay and even less respect. Being a full-fledged journalist from the start would give us the impression that Clark, more than the other characters, is like succeeding at being an adult who already has a solid career even if it was just his first day. By making him an intern, it drags him down from being this mental concept of respectable adult to just trying to be alive, which considering the most common criticism I hear about Superman is that he's not relatable, already within the first few minutes of the show gives the audience something to relate to. You can't super strength yourself into job security, not in this economy. Clark is trying to talk himself up that he is going to be totally normal today and not do anything weird or superpowered, right before he hears a missing cat stuck in a tree and returns it to its owner at lightning speed, because this is a Superman story and you need to have him rescue a cat. This isn't sarcasm, this is tradition. Mommy, mommy, Frisky was stuck in the tree. His man swooped out of the sky and gave him to me. Haven't I told you to stop telling lies? It's not even really reference humor in this show though, because they actually take a moment to further hammer down Clark's personality, which they set up in the introduction. Okay, I had to save the cat. I had to save the cat. I'm a normal man having a normal day starting now. It's actually really good character work, not just having Clark save the cat, which is obvious, but him trying his best to justify to himself that he had to save the cat because clearly 
it's doing something against his better judgment, it's using this trope to actually give us character foundation. Wow, imagine that! Actually using cookie cutter tropes but then fleshing them out to further give character insight. It's almost like you can use tropes as tools to enhance a story rather than crutches to avoid actually writing. Anyway, Clark stops at a small corner store to pick up a shit ton of donuts. Clark also keeps breaking things with his super strength, which he has done three times by this point. It's a little annoying because you would hope he would have enough control with, over his strength not to accidentally break people in half, but considering he's nervous for his first day of work, I'll let it slide based on the fact that otherwise they have been writing his character pretty well so far. You know, in the first four minutes of this show. He runs into Lois for the first time. Hi there, after... you. Oh, I... Huh, I wonder what that's for. Clark decides to try and introduce himself to Lois for obvious reasons, Woman. but the owner of the store completely kills his groove by babying him in front of her. Turns out Clark has on occasion helped her with some repairs around the store. See, it's, it, it's not all for me. But he gets the sprinkles all over. <laughs> That's why we made him the bib. Okay, a bridge too far there, sure. It was cute when it was just Clark being mothered right when he's trying his best to seem cool to a pretty girl, but it's another thing to entirely put him into a fucking baby bib because he eats like a toddler. We're trying to make Clark endearing to the audience, not humiliate him. Luckily, this does actually have the effect of Lois thinking he's cute, and Clark, embarrassed, runs off. At the newspaper building itself, Lois bursts into her boss's office to deliver her pitch for a headline that stolen military robots are being hidden in Metropolis. He completely shuts her down, however, and introduces her to Clark and Jimmy as the new interns. Oh, I... Things almost instantly go off the rails for Perry White, however, as the three interns immediately start discussing Lois's military robot story and how they can go about finding more information. I like this. If this was written badly, it would seem weird and out of place to have our three leads instantly bond. But putting them all together as interns trying to prove themselves and bouncing Jimmy's paranormal obsession off of Lois's over-eagerness helps to rope Clark in as the straight man trying to offer his more measured suggestions to the situation. Plus, we as the audience know these guys want to be journalists, so them instantly pooling their enthusiasm together works perfectly and it results with us having our chaotic friend group who we're going to follow for this show. Mr. White tells Lois she's on her last chance and she has to keep an eye on the other interns and stop trying to report the news. However, when she leaves the office, Lois lies to Clark and Jimmy to rope them into helping her with the robot story. Clark seems skeptical but trusts Lois's word and Jimmy really doesn't care because even if Lois had told him the truth, I'm pretty sure he would have followed her anyway. We cut to the warehouse, where I am sure you'll be shocked to find out is being used to hide the stolen military robots. They're having some trouble as their buyer has disappeared, as has every other buyer in the entirety of Metropolis, which is concerning, but not as concerning as this. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lois has taken Clark and Jimmy to meet one of her information sources, which turns out to be a bunch of newspaper delivery kids. The show then spends a solid minute and a half establishing these kids and giving each one a short introduction on who they are and what job they do on the kids' newspaper. All of which, I'm going to spoil right now, is completely useless information and adds nothing to the show at all because you only see the lead girl flip a few times after this episode, where she barely does anything of importance and the rest of the goonies here never have a single line of dialogue at any point in the show. Oh wait, sorry, I think the one named Big Word says one whole sentence at some point. This once again feels like a Tumblr post of someone just telling you about their OCs who they'll never actually do anything with. Which, again, is fine for posting on Tumblr, but starts grinding my gears when it happens in a professionally made product written by people who I would expect to at the very least have a basic degree in creative writing. Oh wait, 
these are some characters from the 1940s and they took an entire minute and a half on an extended reference which doesn't forward the plot in any real way? Okay. Anyway, the entire pointless sequence is just so that Clark can figure out that a bunch of trucks running a red light are connected to the garbage truck that almost flattened Jimmy earlier. He and Lois both agree that if you wanted to transport something huge like a stolen robot through a city, a garbage truck would be a pretty good cover. The three follow the lead to the warehouse district. However, Clark is starting to become nervous, feeling that things might be getting a little dangerous for Lois and Jimmy before quickly adding it's probably dangerous for him too. Another nice character moment that subtly communicates that Clark's thoughts are always focused on the safety of other people and recognizing when things might be dangerous despite he himself not really having to worry about things like that. I've done so much complaining about terrible character writing in Velma and High Guardian Spice. I want to illustrate how little subtleties and small lines of dialogues and gestures can be used to really strengthen a character when utilized properly, rather than communicate how your main characters are awful people when they're not supposed to be. Clark asks Lois if she's sure her boss is okay with them chasing the story, and Lois doubles down on her lie that they got permission to do this. She bullies Clark into giving her a boost through a window that's too high for her. And we get this shot which I've been seeing make the rounds a lot. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm... Uh... Guys! Huh, 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 huh. Oh, anyway, turns out the criminal group has moved out and the warehouse is empty. They do find an emblem that looks like it came from a uniform, however. But while Jimmy and Lois are trying to figure out what MP could stand for, their boss phones Clark since Lois is ghosting him and tells Clark if they don't get back to the Daily Planet, they're fired. Lois, meanwhile, is ready to go to the docks after figuring out off-screen that the emblem is for a dock worker's jacket. Clark isn't amused, however, and calls her out on lying to him about Mr. White being okay with all of this. Lois tries to defend herself, saying that they wouldn't have helped if she told them the truth, and Clark counters with the actual fact that Lois didn't even give them a chance and just jumped straight to lying. This isn't about the city, Lois. It's about you. I trusted you, and you used me, and Jimmy, just so you could get your story. Lois tries to salvage the situation by saying how the three of them are a team, but Clark rightfully shuts her down, saying they're not a team, they're two people who she tricked into believing a lie. Lois is unhappy with someone trying to give her a slice of reality and snaps at Clark that she doesn't need his help anyway and drags Jimmy off with her. Jimmy doesn't get autonomy, I guess. Lois proceeds to rant at Jimmy the entire trip to the dock about how she can't believe Clark would call her out on her bullshit. But Jimmy doesn't even need to say anything for Lois to realize how unfair she sounds, especially as she starts remembering how every time she's seen Clark so far, he has always been willing to help people, and she really had no valid reason for lying to him. Lois has, in the past two minutes of screen time, shown more self-awareness of how her action towards other people was unfair and how she was the one in the wrong and felt remorse for how she has been behaving than Sage did at any point in High Guardian Spies or literally any of the characters in Velma. See, I could have very easily taken this moment of friction between her and Clark and painted Lois as a selfish bitch who is willing to lie to people to get what she wants. And when confronted with her actions, becomes defensive and pulls a Darvo, and how this would make her an unlikable character. But it takes less than a minute of screen time for her to reassess her own actions and choices and come to the conclusion, all by herself, that she was in the wrong. Seriously, Jimmy doesn't open his mouth even once during this scene, except to ask if Lois was calling Clark hot in between her ranting. But the show is actually perfectly comfortable in allowing one of its main characters simply to be wrong about something. And she doesn't have to self flagellate or anything. Just a simple realization of, oh wow, wait, I think I might be the asshole. And that's all you really need. Especially when Lois's moment of clarity is interrupted by them spotting the stolen robots being transported. They get caught pretty much immediately, however, and the stolen robots get activated to kill these two random people. Why? 
I would you use the robot? Oh, Flip is also here for some reason? I don't know how I feel about a little girl hanging around a big city dock around sunset. Oh wait, now I see why this little girl is hanging around the dock. It's so that she can witness this nonsense and go find Clark to tell him Lois and Jimmy are in trouble. I will give her credit that Flip didn't mean for Clark to actually be the one to help, but was instead just trying to find a friendly adult who might know what to do. And she just happens to find the adult with super speed and an overdeveloped sense of altruism. Also, Clark was wondering to himself if Lois was indeed in the right to lie to him, because he might not have helped her if she told him the truth. Which I'm gonna chalk this one up to Clark being an idiot who is just self-guessing himself. Especially since the very next thing we see is him running to literally help Lois and Jimmy. So this moment of the show possibly wondering if Lois did the right thing in lying gets a pass. Just this once. Just once. He does say he admires Lois, however, and my question is, why? You've known her for all of four hours, and the only thing she has done in those four hours is lie to you for her own benefit. Ugh, whatever. Clark runs into Lois before seeing Jimmy about to get turned into a smear on the tarmac and pushes him out of the way, getting himself flung into the mandatory stack of boxes that all docks are required to have. Lois and Jimmy are horrified but can't do anything about it as the robot focuses back on squishing them. Clark shakes off the robot punch and jumps back in to protect his friends just as the robot is winding up for a punch, having enough sense to grab a fireman's jacket and hood to hide his face. Lois and Jimmy are stunned but Jimmy has enough journalistic instinct to at least attempt to grab some photos. After trading some blows, Clark very quickly figures out that the robot is being powered by the red gem on its chest, which I actually really appreciate. I am so far enjoying the interpretation of Clark as a very large, soft-hearted, but slightly shy dude. Like he's a character from Heartstoppers or something. But it can be a tricky line to walk, having a character be a good boy who tries hard, but is naive and a little gullible, to just writing him as being dumb. So I appreciate them establishing in the very first episode that although Clark is clearly a little reckless and throwing himself into danger to protect other people, he's clearly not stupid. Anyway, Clark rips off the gem and kills the robot. Also, weirdly, they show during this little scuff that Clark has managed to get himself a black eye as well as a few scrapes. Now, the show is gonna sort of do something with this, except not really. So it was a little confusing to see at first, because I wasn't really sure what level of vulnerability we're going to be dealing with in this show. And I will say, after having seen all 10 episodes, I kind of still don't really know. We'll get into it more as we go along, but this was really where this strange handling of how much damage Clark can actually handle starts. In response to Clark killing the robot, our lead bad guy here activates all the robots. Lois notices her using the activation panels, however, and while Clark is getting the crap beat out of him, manages to turn at least one of them off. Of course, this immediately makes her a target, but she keeps trying her best to hit every panel, and it's only after she nearly gets seared in half that Clark panics and goes Super Saiyan, zipping forward and punching the robot into next week. The sudden burst of energy also causes his black eye to heal, which is… never really explained… ever? I mean, if you want to count learning Superman as an alien, sure, but it seems like such a very specific detail to purposefully draw attention to with close-ups and everything for it to, ultimately, just never get addressed. Does Clark take damage or does he not? Does he have super healing or does he not? Please show, this is a detail you can't be vague about when you want to talk about Superman. We need to know how much danger our lead character is in when he fights things, otherwise we don't know what the stakes are. The way this show is communicating things according to this episode is, Clark has a power surge when he gets distressed, and his power surge has a side effect of healing any superficial damage he might get. Those are the rules set up by this episode. But the show doesn't really spell this out very clearly and actually doesn't do much with Clark's panic-induced power surges either. As we move forward to other episodes, Clark will slowly have more of his powers activate, but the show is struggling to give us a clear picture of where Clark starts in terms of powers and abilities, 
so we know what exactly is brand new to him. We saw him pull a similar stunt as a child earlier, so clearly this is far from the first time his powers have kicked into overdrive this way. But the intro also shows that before that first power surge, Clark couldn't fly or presumably had anything like super strength or speed. But this episode has shown him clearly having both super speed and strength, and he can already fly. But then he needed this panic-induced power surge to punch a robot harder than usual, I guess? And it also heals injuries? If this is a new power surge that's going to unlock new powers for him, having him display the exact same powers as the intro when this happened makes this very confusing as to what the clear line of powering up these power surges cause. For now, let's just say the power surge he had at the beginning was him first awakening to basic powers and this surge caused a lot of video game leveling up of the already developed powers as well as healing I guess. While Clark is looking just as confused by these events as I am, Lois asks him who he is. Clark flies away before she can get a clear look at him and Lois stares after him for a moment before, to her credit, she suddenly remembers Clark got knocked into a pile of boxes and runs to go make sure he's okay. Actually big props to her here. She's amazed by this sudden mystery man as well as finding the giant robots and such, but the second things calms down, she instantly remembers her friend might be hurt and runs off to help him rather than trying to get more info on the strange flying person or the killer robots. Meanwhile, Clark is a little disappointed at having failed at being normal for one single day and has this little moment, which I'm sure the writers thought was cute but doesn't actually make sense to me. <sighs> a normal man having a normal day, huh? Who am I? Clark! Clark! It's cute Lois calling Clark in response to him asking who am I, but I don't know. It just feels weird for him to blurt these two lines out like this right after each other. It just feels clunky and I'm a little overly aware of the writer really wanting this moment in the show, which isn't great. Lawrence of Arabia, this is not. Who are you? Who are you? Lois starts digging through what was originally boxes but is now rubble where she last saw Clark finding his discarded tie, and is about to freak out when Clark, who he discarded, runs over to reassure her he's okay. I'm sorry I lied, you were right, I was being selfish and just left us but you came back and... and... Oh, also... Oh, I... Okay, I know this is a lot of clips all after each other but... Please look at this, because I was flabbergasted when I saw it. Okay, so Lois grabs Jimmy's jacket here, asking if he got any photos. And then this scene ends, and the next scene begins, and Lois is in the right pose to be grabbing Jimmy's jacket, but he's all the way over here. And it's because the camera zooms out slightly for this pose. But like, wow, wow, what on earth happened here? I can only assume this is an animation error which happened due to the camera movement and something went wrong with whatever layer Jimmy was on, but this is far from the only thing wrong in this sequence. To better help me explain what is wrong here, I asked for some help from my friend Tinas, who was a lead storyboarder on one of the newest seasons of Archer. This scene ends with the characters in this pose. This pose is already problematic. All our characters are squished into the middle of the scene, and the poses are not communicated very well. There are a lot of tangent lines, like Clark's shoulders lining up directly with the shipping containers behind him. The show also has a continuous problem of never using the open book pose when characters talk to each other. In staging for animation, a pretty standard practice that has been in place pretty much since the 1930s is the open book pose, where two characters are having a conversation. In real life, we tend to speak directly facing each other, but in animation, this closes off the posing and excludes the audience from the conversation. So instead, characters will usually speak to each other in a three-quarter angle. Anime tends to have the characters facing each other directly, but will instead use shot reverse shot and interesting camera angles to compensate for the lack of fluid animation. 
This show, on the other hand, so often have characters speaking directly to each other, closing themselves off to the audience and making their poses stiff at best and difficult to read at worst. And it's no different in this shot with Lois and Jimmy. So that needs fixing. Clark is also directly between them, completely cluttering up the shot and making the composition claustrophobic for no reason. Tina's offered some basic reposing and fixing of the composition. We then have a direct cut to the scene in question. Jimmy is in the wrong place and I think this is the biggest problem with the scene as a whole. However, not only is this an error, but the background is also now different to the shot before it, showing the rubble Lois was digging through instead of the shipping containers. But that's a continuity mistake. Jimmy moves to his next key pose. First off, the perspective is not great for this shot. Again, this is most likely because the storyboard did not accurately show what the perspective lines on this shot are supposed to be. This weakens Jimmy's pose regarding his arm and the overall perspective which makes the anatomy weird. His hand is also going out of the action safe zone and his other hand is creating a tangent with Lois's hand. Clark is also once again standing on top of Lois and cluttering up her posing due to him not being moved from his already awkward posing in the previous shot and no measure taken to put him in a better position, either through cheating via editing or just having him literally use four frames to turn. And that is the breakdown for everything wrong in this sequence. Now, this doesn't take into account any style guide which might have imposed certain limitations to what the borders could do. But if that is the case, then adhering too closely to the style guide has resulted in what I can only call poor filmmaking. An animated show is so much more than a bunch of animators getting together to make something. Animation is just one small cog in a very large machine. And if any of the other cogs in the machine are not working in the way they're supposed to, then the end product suffers for it. And you would probably be genuinely shocked at how many problems in modern cartoons are not actually animation problems, but storyboard problems. Anyway, trying my best to ignore the absolute travesty of filmmaking I just had to witness, Jimmy is excited he managed to get photos of the fight, much to Clark's dismay. Lois is pumped and comes up with the headline, Superman destroys military robots, which is fine. And we smash cut to Mr. White being completely unamused by Jimmy's panic motion blurred screenshots of the episode that don't actually prove anything. Clark stands up for Lois, backing up her claim that they tracked down the stolen robots. Oh, I... And Mr. White is too exhausted to deal with them and tell them to just get out of his office. They're not fired, but he has no interest in publishing their story about a flying man without proof. Basically, Pixar didn't happen. Lois is not deterred, however, focusing on the fact that if they can somehow get an interview with the Superman, she will definitely get a story in the paper. That's your takeaway from all this? Lois promises not to keep any more secrets, oh, I... but she also declares that it is now her life's mission to track down Superman, found out everything about him, uncover all his secrets and put them on the front page. We cut to credits with a sound alike for the original John Williams Superman theme. Why not just use the John Williams Superman theme? Did the copyright run out? I doubt it because I bet you anything if I play so much as one bar of it in this video, WB is gonna pulverize my channel. I'm not saying you should never update a superhero theme. Of course you can update superhero themes. But if you do so, you're going to have to create something that can at least compete with what you had before. Or go in a different direction than the version that is completely embedded in the public consciousness. I think the Snyder films are hot garbage, but I actually don't mind him having a different theme for Superman in that film, because the John Williams theme is supposed to be full of hope and optimism and inspiring awe in the audience, whereas Snyder films are meant to make you think they're super cool because they're so edgy and dark, which means they're totally mature. So you can't have like a good hopeful superhero theme for Superman. You need something nihilistic and as devoid of color and life as the rest of the film. And I know all of that was just veiled insults towards Snyder's movies, but I do genuinely mean that. The John Williams theme would not work for Snyder's movie, but it could work perfectly well for this show. But the only reason I am even thinking of the original theme at all is because the show decided to use something which kind of makes you think of the original theme, 
but just in a vastly inferior way. If you had done something different, I would not be making this comparison. Hell, even the 75th anniversary short uses the classic theme, because you would! That's what you would do! Either commit, or do something else. But that's it for the very first episode. Not a bad episode, really. There's a lot of really clunky writing here, things that happen out of convenience, or characters speaking or behaving in unnatural or forced ways, just because it's something the writers wants them to do. But at least, if nothing else, the first episode gets the characters right, and I didn't think I'd have to say this, but apparently writing Superman as a likable optimistic person who cares about other people's safety is a bar a lot of recent Superman content seems unable to clear. Probably because Hollywood has become allergic to sincerity. It's never too late to stop being a dick. How about a little more? But genuinely, Clark is a very likable character, even if he had nothing to do with Superman. He's a big rugby player of a guy, but who is clearly gentle-hearted, a little naive, but with a strong desire to help others and just get through a single day without things spiraling out of control around him. I once read somewhere that the big difference between Batman and Superman is that Bruce Wayne is the mask that Batman wears, while as Superman is the mask that Clark Kent wears. And I think this show sets that up very well. People always compliment the almost dual role Christopher Reeves plays in the 1970s Superman film. And I agree. But in the 70s Superman film, it's very clear that Superman is a lot more genuine to who Clark is as a person than the awkward, bumbling Clark Kent persona he acts as. And this is a valid way to write Superman, but I enjoy the concept that Clark is who Superman really is as a person and that Superman is the persona. Not a complete fake of a character like the billionaire Bruce Wayne playboy often is, but Superman is more what Clark feels are his best personality traits pushed forward, with his more vulnerable human side masked, for lack of a better word. And I actually am a big fan of this show taking the character of Clark as the shy awkward nerd being Clark's real personality. This is 100% who Clark is as a person. It's not an act to make him seem unlikely to be Superman. This is who he is. And for a character whose biggest criticism is him being unrelatable, I think this is an absolute galaxy brain solution to this problem. If you even want to call it a problem. I mean, Superman has been a cool character before, you just weren't paying attention. That was my best friend. And you just killed him. I also rather like Lois so far. She's overly ambitious, which blinds her to other people, but she isn't a reporter in this version. She's an intern, desperate to finally become a full-time employee. Her over-eager desire to get a big story isn't just her drive as a journalist, it's genuinely fueled by frustration and impatience about her own life. So her making mistakes by roping other people into her schemes to finally break out of the rut she's been forced into is understandable. However, even though she has more than a valid reason for behaving this way, the show is perfectly happy portraying her as pushing her desires too far, and having other characters calling her out for doing the wrong thing, and then allows Lois to slowly realize that she has not been a good person. She doesn't simply cave after the first criticism, but resists at first, and it takes a minute for her to think over what she's doing before she admits to herself that she's in the wrong. This alone would actually be enough to keep her likable to the audience, but the show also makes sure to have her directly apologize to the person she wronged and admit her shortcomings, without coating it with a bunch of quantifiers and explanations to try and reduce the accountability of her actions. Unlike some other characters I could mention, I'm sorry to everything in here. It's just anxious and chaos. Oh, and Jimmy's there too, I guess. Don't worry, we'll be getting to Jimmy. He just didn't have too much to do in this episode, except yell about aliens now and then. All in all, not a bad start. Not a great start, but hey, the first episode of a new show is often the most awkward, 
a little weirdly paced with some strange story decisions. So this is fine. It's fine. It's going to be fine. Episode 2 opens with Ma and Pa Kent showing Clark the ship he came to Earth with. In the past, Clark's ship has always been pretty much an escape pod, not much else. So I find the idea of making Clark's ship an actual full-size spaceship an interesting concept. It does open up some story problems like how did an entire ass spaceship crash into the Kent's crops and nobody else noticed and also didn't recreate the Tunguska event. However, there is a small mention later when they unearth the ship again that it's bigger than it was before, so I guess that waves away that mystery. Clark steps onto the ship and making physical contact with it causes it to power up and activate the good old Jor-El AI. Here is where I'm gonna have to operate with my own meta knowledge of Superman outside of the show because my adventure with the Superman does something with the Jor-El AI I have never seen done before and I think is worth talking about. Filo, come longy arms ke father on. No more me Jorel. What's he saying? So, unlike all other Superman media I am aware of, in this incarnation, Jorel exclusively speaks Kryptonian, and Clark cannot understand him. Although it is shown that Jorel does understand Clark. This actually becomes a plot point later, and I really like this. The only change in the story this show does is to have Clark not understand Jor-El. And the reason why is because, well, Jor-El is an alien. You can nitpick and complain why does Jor-El not speak English when he can understand Clark, but on a story writing level, this changes up the origin story without really betraying anything about it or vastly altering who canon characters are. But I'll get into it a little bit more when we get back to Jor-El, because in this flashback, Clark is so shaken up by this revelation that he's an alien, and after seeing his mom and dad almost fall into the chasm created by the ship, he's quick to disengage the AI, save his parents, and cover the ship up, swearing to never come here ever again. Who am I? Who am I? We cut back to present day where Lois proudly reveals to Clark and Jimmy that she has procured one of the Daily Planet storage rooms to be their new office. Without asking Perry White, of course. She also reveals to Clark and Jimmy her conspiracy board, which she calls a murder board for some reason, which she plans to use to find out everything they can about Superman. Jimmy is 100% on board and we get our first introduction to Jimmy's YouTube channel which he calls a stream because the creators of the show seem confused as to what the difference is, called Flamebird, where he puts up videos discussing various supernatural stuff and occasionally talks about Superman. He's an alien case closed. Why is it so dark in here? Lois isn't impressed because she prefers to operate on facts and logic. Clark tries to gently steer Lois away from focusing on Superman by pointing out that Mr. White hates the story. A man flew down from the sky and risked his life to save us. Not for a reward or fame, but just because we needed help. Don't you want to know who that person is? You're right. I need to know. This double meaning talk is... Okay, I guess. The show does it maybe too many times, but it's fine. Clark then fakes food poisoning so he can literally zip all the way over to Smallville. And Lois drags Jimmy into finding the person who tried to kill them. We also see the first instance of some reoccurring animation problems. First we have some frame cutting here before we settle back into the animation being on twos, which I don't understand why we have frame cutting here unless this was a we ran out of time thing. Switching to fewer frames is sometimes used as a stylistic choice during action scenes, but to do it in a basic dialogue scene is very weird. And the other problem is the line work. Most scenes in this show have line work that looks the way line work is supposed to look for this style of show. That being, lines which are thin, do not have line weight to them, and are generally very crisp. But for some reason, sometimes the line work has anti-aliasing in this show. But 
more distractingly, it has line weight to it. This wouldn't be a problem at all if the entire show had this style of line work, but because the show is very clearly not using the style for its vast majority, the handful of scenes which look like they should be in a Ghibli film can only be classified as a mistake. Hello, I'm Seapuff. I work in the ink and paint department. I get paid to notice these things. Back with Clark. He shows up at home and tells his mom like a kid who broke a window at school that he saved people and was spotted. He also offhandedly mentions Lois, Hi. but ultimately comes to the point that he feels he can't just avoid the truth of who he is anymore and he needs to go back to the spaceship buried in the field. Jimmy and Lois are off on their plan to find the would-be murderer's boat during which Lois starts wondering if Clark's okay Jimmy makes fun of her for liking him and she denies it. Next. Clark is digging up his spaceship as his parents anxiously watch until Pa Kent just nopes out. Is it just me or is this bigger than it used to be? See, this is the part I was talking about. Also, no, it doesn't actually look bigger than it used to be. You might have wanted to communicate that a little better visually because it would have cleared up a lot of questions I have. Clark gets zapped into the interior of the ship. It seems they've combined the ship and the Fortress of Solitude into one singular thing in this version, which I'm fine with. The show is building this narrative that Clark is not getting full information about himself or Krypton. So streamlining things like combining the ship and the Fortress of Solitude aids the story and cuts out a lot of unnecessary fat. It's changing the tradition of canon in a way that doesn't betray it, but still gives us something different for interesting reasons rather than trying to do away with things that are inconvenient for the plot. Back to the show, Clark is still unable to understand anything jor says. I don't know if Kryptonian is an actual functional language like Klingon, but I can make out the words AI and Sprecht amongst the things that jor says. I'm guessing the ship was supposed to teach Clark how to understand jor but something went wrong. The breadcrumbs are there, so I don't think this is me doing the writer's job for them. Unable to directly speak to Clark, jor instead shows him the destruction of Krypton and we actually see the escape pod sized ship. So okay, I guess it did start off very small and is slowly growing under the farm. I guess. I don't know, having the ship look like this in the flashback and then borderline identical in present day, aside from Clark telling us it's gotten bigger, is still not the best way to communicate this. Anyway, then this happens. Josie because I know this was your doing. I just have one question about this scene. Why? That's not me being facetious. That is a legitimate question that I have for you. Why did you decide to have Superman acquire his suit in a magical girl transformation sequence that is deliberately and purposefully trying to invoke Sailor Moon? Obviously, we're nerds and we're weebs, so there are specific shout outs, like, for instance, the transformation sequence in episode two, say. <laughs> which, which is absolutely a reference. The 90s was this explosion of anime hitting American airwaves. And for us as kids, it was being presented right next to Western media. Uh, so we grew up and we grew up into people who are exa as influenced by an the anime we watched as kids as we were influenced by the Western cartoons we watched as kids. No, no, you're not understanding the question. I am asking why, as in, why did you decide to take a moment which is character significant and important to the plot and decide that this is the moment you wanted to instead make the audience think, oh, this is like Sailor Moon. And so in a lot of ways, this is just kind of uh, how our generation draws and writes. Um, what we've done, at least again here in America, is like, you know, like the artists that we've hired on the show, like, you know, that the way they draw is anime influenced, but like now it's kind of their own style. <sighs> Josie, let me rephrase. Why was making a Sailor Moon reference more important to you 
then emotionally connecting with why this moment is important to Clark. Josie? Josie, do you have an answer for me? Because this is not the first time you've done this, Josie. That being completely and utterly throwing away all importance of what a scene and moment means for the characters experiencing them in favor of aping and copying the iconography of anime that you like in a way where you are deliberately trying to invoke those shows in your product. Most often at times which should have the biggest emotional impact either to the audience or the characters themselves. It's not because it's a transformation scene. Hell, if it were me, I'd take more inspiration from other transformation sources for Superman because I think the idea of a transformation sequence could be fun. The problem is, you seem to only ever fall back onto Sailor Moon, regardless of what could be more thematically appropriate. Shira had a really nice transformation sequence you could have taken your inspiration from, but no, Sailor Moon. In the moments where your story needs it the most, both this show and Shira, the two shows you have had the biggest hand in, they have a tendency to crumble under the pressure and instead just copy things you like in the hope that simply reminding the audience of those things will somehow translate what made those things good into your show because you desperately want the same level of emotional payoff. However, instead of trying to craft your own iconography which people could then look to as their favorite moments in the show, you simply go, hey look a reference, but not even as a joke. Not even as lazy comedy, but as actual important scenes which should matter. And instead of writing a moment that matters, you put in a Sailor Moon reference. And for what? For what reason did you decide to betray the emotional importance of the scene? Because you think it's cute? Because you didn't know how to make something that hits emotionally yourself? Because you thought it was funny? because you thought this was the right moment to do a reference? Why do you have such disrespect for story integrity? Also for fuck's sake, the idea of a Marvel or superhero making a magical girl transformation sequence has been a part of online parody for years now. Keyword being parody. You are doing the parody unironically. You are doing a nostalgia critic style reference, but not as a joke. What are you doing? And you know, like if like to get like a tiny bit historical about it, that's kind of always been the case. Like, you know, uh, uh, Asama Tsutsuka, the uh, 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 Astro Boy was influenced by Disney. Like he was drawing those giant eyes because of Disney. And so, like, if you try to chart the, like, who influenced who, like, Japan or America, what you're drawing is a giant circle. Your abilities may be of my blood, but it is your time in Smallville with Jonathan and Martha Kent and all the people there that made you a hero, Connor. What is this? After you left, I had a dream of you flying. Only it wasn't the boy that I knew, it was you now. So I made this. They can be a great people, Kalel. They wish to be. They only lack the light to show the way. For this reason, above all, their capacity for good. I have sent them you. So it's a it's a it's it's an ongoing we're stealing from each other. <laughs> you did not make Sailor Moon. You did not make Utena. You did not make Card Captor Sakura. I just wish 
you would make something yourself, something meaningful and emotional, or even just try. I wish you had the courage to try. You want to make the most fantastic art of movie? Try. If you fail, it's not important. No? We need to try. Clark emerges from the ship, now wearing the Superman outfit. Don't worry, I'm still me, Ma. I'm still your son. Maybe it's just because of the videos I've been watching to research this review, but I can't help but feel this line is here to directly oppose Snyder's Man of Steel. There is an entire essay you could write about every single way Snyder does not understand Superman and most often doesn't so much write Superman out of character as write Superman in complete contradiction to how the character should be at its core. From the constant shallowed surface level Christ allegory stuff, which basically amounts to nothing deeper than literally this. Oh my god, doesn't this remind you of Jesus? I'm like Jesus! I'm Jesus! Feel sorry for me! I'm Jesus! To his insistence and reinforcing the point that Clark, uh, sorry, Kal-El is not human, is not from Earth, and that Pa and Ma Kent are not his parents. I found them. Who? My parents. All of which is... Wow. You could not have gotten this character more wrong. Like, this took actual effort to be this antithetical to what Superman is supposed to be. So, for what is essentially the exact same scene, to have this line here feels like a serious attempt to fly in the face of Snyder's nonsense which, despite being very on the nose, I'm fine with. Since it is an unambiguous course correct that does not leave much room for interpretation. To further drive the point home, Ma Kent also comments that Superman's costume needs something to make it feel complete, and she makes the red shorts. The shorts add a lot, don't they? Which, considering the red shorts are missing from Snyder's version, also feels like a deliberate drawing of the line. It's borderline hostile to the Snyder version of Superman, but considering how badly Snyder's interpretation to this character completely veered off course and bastardized everything Superman is supposed to be, I'm not as angry as I could be. I'm not even that passionate about Superman or Snyder. I just feel the righteous indignation that people who care about this character have for Snyder's version. Oh, also. Lois and Jimmy have found the boat and discovered tire tracks going into a nearby drainage tunnel. Jimmy trolls Lois about taking a selfie with her and then immediately sending it to Clark. Hi. Also, this has nothing to do with the show itself, but can I just say I hate this hand symbol? I know it's supposed to be a heart. I know that. I know what it's supposed to be. I just hate it. I hate it so much. I always feel like the person is pulling some other obscene gesture to insult me, but it's from a culture I'm not part of, so I won't get the full context. So they feel comfortable aiming it at me because they know I can tell it's an insult, but they also know I can't prove it because I don't know what it means. And yes, I know that's very hyper-specific, but that's genuinely how it makes me feel. Do you buy your thumbnails, sir? I do buy my thumbs up! Do you buy your thumbnails? Sir. Is Lobo side if I say I? No! Oh, also, the robot thief strapped C4 to the walls. We cut to above the drainage tunnel to downtown Metropolis, where the woman who stole the robots is meeting with people who have been stalking her since the fight. Upon meeting Raiden here, she guesses the people who have been following her are Black Ops or something similar. They trade really uninspired dialogue about the thief having tech she shouldn't, and in trade, she wants Black Ops to call off Superman because she's under the impression he's working for them. Which, honestly, is a pretty fair assumption on her part. When Raiden refuses, she adds that she's rigged certain points in the city to explode. Just as they're about to go into bargaining, Jimmy and Lois pop up from a manhole. The thief thinks they're in league with Raiden because she recognizes them from the docks, and she starts a fight. This is where the thief throws off her jacket and shows that she's using some of the stolen tech as weaponry. 
And this is where I need to tell you, if you are not aware yet, that this thief character wearing generic military gear? This is a DC character called Livewire. I know nothing about Livewire, except for the fact that she usually looks like this. You know, instead of what this show is going for, which is... Generic military body armor in shades of black and grey, like she's a PS3 character or something. I don't care about the change in race, and I don't mind the hairstyle too much, but this is an objectively inferior design to this. This is a cool and memorable supervillain design. This is John Freeman, who was Gordon Freeman's brother. You can change the character designs if you want, but did you have to make them so shockingly boring? Actually, let's talk about the character design for a brief moment. Clark slash Superman, I have no problem with. This is good, nothing to critique. Generally, I'm okay with Lois's design as a concept. However, every single time she's on screen, I am incredibly distracted by how her nasal passage is caved in due to a horrific case of syphilis. When will we put an end to the unethical breeding practices of anime girls? I also rather find her colors to be dull. The outfit itself is fine, it reminds me a little of the outfits in Edge Runners, but the colors are just very bland. I don't know, I feel like this design could have been left in the oven for a little bit longer. Jimmy I have very little problems with. I just really dislike what both this show and Velma did, which is to make the palms of black characters lighter than the rest of the hand. And before you come at me with any kind of racial discussion or comments about real life, this ain't about that. When you draw hands, which you should be doing more of, you want to try and simplify them as much as possible without losing strong posing. This is an animation basic. Hands are incredibly complex appendages with a large amount of parts that make them up. Five fingers with three joints each plus four knuckles, tendons running from knuckles to the back of the wrist and fingernails. Throw in complex posing and perspective and that is a lot of information. There is a reason why we typically do not draw palm creases in animation unless we are looking at an extreme close-up of a hand. And even then, we simplify the creases. Unless a character is supposed to be old, or we want to purposefully make hands look grotesque. I don't like the lighter palms on black characters, because they never do it for any other POC characters for some reason. Because I find it visually distracting and it muddles up what is already a complex part of the human body. The hand is actually the second most important part when it comes to posing, as it is the most expressive part of the human body that isn't the face. You can often tell a character's expression or their mood simply by their hand posing. So it is incredibly important to keep those poses clear and that they communicate to the audience. Also, I just don't really like it personally, so that is also partly on me. I don't like it when furries emphasize pull pads on hands either. I'm not a fan of the style or character design. Maybe it's as simple as that. I didn't mention it in Velma because it's not really a big deal, but this is the second time I've come across this in a show and it felt disingenuous for me to ignore it. Unfortunately, because this is specifically about how POC characters are designed, I understand I run the risk of sounding insensitive when really, it's not for me, is as deep as it goes in this case. Is that okay? Are we all okay with that? Lois instructs Jimmy to keep taking pictures while she goes for the detonator which Livewire dropped. Jimmy phones Clark, alerting him on what's going on and we cut back to the fight. The animation is actually not half bad here and appropriately, Superman shows up just in time to save the day and we get an admittedly great hero shot. <gasps> Lois asks him if he has a comment for the paper, oh, I... but Livewire, I guess, doesn't so much recognize Superman as she figures he's a dude that can fly, so he's probably the same guy who screwed up her plans on the pier, and she throws a truck at him. She then focuses on setting off the bombs in the sewer, but Jimmy has the good sense to warn Superman about it. Before anyone can do anything, however, Raiden jumps in and attacks the jewel on Livewire's back. 
instead of shutting her down like the robots, however, this causes the tech to go into overdrive. Clark, being smart, figures out the jewel is the thing causing this and moves to try and remove it. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help. Livewire lashes out, causing Clark to have a brief vision of spaceships before he removes the jewel. He then checks with Jimmy and Lois to make sure they're okay, during which Livewire disappears. Clark then realizes they've kind of caused a giant mess and does his best to tidy up. Again, this feels like directly addressing one of the bigger complaints about Snyder's Superman, which was the complete and utter disregard for human life. Again, I'm not mad at this. Jimmy gets a proper photo this time, Perry White is finally convinced and declares that they have a front page story, and Lois subscribes to Jimmy's YouTube account. Jimmy says Lois should tell Clark she likes him and Mr. White kicks them out of his office saying he doesn't want to hear about their story about the literal flying man. Sure, whatever. Clark sneaks back into his apartment. Lois comes over as a surprise and the two stammer at each other. Lois gushing about how she got her story and Clark insists he knew she could make it happen. He calls Lois extraordinary and dumps a few compliments on her. And uh, driven and smart and, and funny and, and smart. You said that already? Well, I stand by it. Oh, I... And Jimmy, who just told Lois she should tell Clark how she feels, interrupts them to show them the advanced copy of tomorrow's paper. But it doesn't include anything they actually wrote, which I'm a little confused by. Did they actually write anything for the paper and Perry threw it out? Did they write something and he put it under pseudonyms for some reason? Or did they hand over the photos as proof, write nothing, went over to see if Clark was still feeling sick, and then act shocked and outraged when the article they didn't write was written by somebody else? Anyway, it turns out Livewire didn't escape. She was captured by Raiden, who has her strapped to a chair and zaps her with a shock collar, demanding to know who Superman is. Obviously, she has no idea, and the episode ends with us seeing two new characters as we cut to credits. So, this episode isn't a train wreck or anything, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't get under my skin. On the one hand, I really appreciate the very deliberate decisions made to emphasize Clark's humanity. I also like the concept of Clark not being able to understand Jor-El and how this will affect Superman moving forward. Everything with Superman slash Clark is good. I have no real problems here and honestly have nothing but high praise for it. However, there are some very annoying decisions made in this episode on a visual level which really bother me. From the refusal to commit to important story moments, to uninspired character designs, to weird conveniences that exist because they need to so that the plot can make sense. It's not a terrible episode, but only because Superman himself is saving it, as he should being the main character. But if he wasn't here to carry this episode, I would be a lot more negative about this one. Episode 3 opens with a blimp crashing into a skyscraper and Superman coming to save both the pilot as well as the people in danger of having debris fall on them. Superman asks if everyone is okay but the crowd is so stunned that they just awkwardly stare at him. I find this moment odd. I understand maybe for a second being unsure what to make of seeing a flying man but this is after the headline of Superman's existence has been published. But rather than playing up the awe of the crowd witnessing Superman rescue them, the show instead goes for awkwardness. Is everyone okay? <clears throat> I'll take that as a yes. The only person who hasn't had grey matter shut down is Lois, who appears out of the crowd to ask him some questions and Superman bails, much to her annoyance. We then cut to a prison to witness a prison break in which two men, both wielding the same kind of tech Livewire was using, breaking out their sister. These characters are portrayed immediately as idiots, squabbling about using their real names in public and coming across as inept, but having the tech to be dangerous. They give their sister some tech as well, and they all skedaddle as we cut to the intro. A few things. 
First, the line art inconsistency is at its highest in this episode and specifically in these scenes. Secondly, I'm just gonna let you guys know right now that these are also pre-established Superman villains, namely Mist, Rough House and Banshee. In comparison, Rough House is more of a lateral move in terms of design and from what I gather was barely a character to begin with. The Mist might as well be a completely different character entirely. But as for Banshee, here's what she looks like in this show, and here's what she usually looks like. I don't even really know what I'm supposed to say about this other than, look at these two side by side. Listen, as I said, I don't mind redesigning a character, but really, maybe at least do something? Anything? Ugh. And third, something I have been noticing with this show the more episodes I go through. That being, every single character in this show talks the exact same way. I don't mean that they have the same voice or that they have the same personality, but every single character's way of speaking is identical. This is a symptom of an inexperienced writer usually. Generally, some of the best tools a writer can have is to have every character have such a distinct way of speaking that you do not even need a book to tell you who is talking for you to identify the current speaker. To create a character so distinct in their mannerisms and how they express themselves that they are instantly recognizable. No, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm after a frock, one of them 500 pound ones. Please, if you could wait over here, somebody will attend you directly. You need to have a little bit of faith and let us do the job of replacing Giambi. Is there another first baseman like Giambi? No, not really. No. And if there was, could we afford him? No. Nope. Then what the fuck are you talking about, man? Interesting that he'd find a knife exactly like the one the boy bought. What's interesting about it? Interesting. I don't know, I just thought it was interesting. There are still 11 of us here who think he's guilty. And this mark of inexperience is something that is present in every single character in this show, where the only real way to identify who is who is due to the voice actors and the visuals. The only characters who seem to have a level of individuality is Clark and then Lois and Jimmy. And the only reason in this case is because Clark's dialogue is easily identified in contrast to the more energetic Lois and Jimmy. However, Lois and Jimmy speak very much the same way and are not identifiable from each other apart from what they say rather than how they say it. Superman also has an identifiable way of speaking which is unique from Clark, but he has the advantage of having very little dialogue. So when he does speak, it's almost always with confidence and purpose. The only other character who seems to have some level of individuality is Livewire. And even then, she doesn't because she speaks in teenage levels of sneering bad guy, something that is identical to how Raiden speaks. You have no idea what kind of technology you're dealing with. Then I'd say it's a good thing I planted explosives all over the city. Here's a fun fact you need to know now. This is actually the show's version of Deathstroke. The fact that every character speaks identically and would be completely unidentifiable were it not for the context of what they're actually talking about is also very weak because every single character, regardless of age, speak like millennials, including Ma and Pa Kent, Perry White, and the villains. Although this might be exacerbated by who casting chose to voice act an elderly couple. Imagine if you will, a show made in the mid to late 80s where every single character spoke like they're from the valley, but not as a joke. I saw this guy coming and I took the most excellent hit of my life. Awesome! <laughs> like I said, however, this is at least one symptom of an inexperienced writer rather than laziness or incompetence. You could ask how somebody inexperienced could be given the job of writing actual scripts for broadcast, but the Hollywood industry is so riddled with who people make friends with at Cal Arts that wondering why people with lesser writing experience are in charge of writing for entire projects is just a waste of time and energy and patience on your part. Jeff, how many screenplays have you written in your career? This was uh, the first one. Oh, the first one. 
the first one. <laughs> I don't know if I told you that or not when you when you hired me. How the hell were you given the reins to a screenplay with the backing of multiple hundreds of millions of dollars? That's insane. Think about that. That's insane. Yeah, it's insane. First screenplay written as he goes along. So here we are, where our villains for this episode are three awkward 20-somethings who will run at odds with the other group of awkward 20-somethings. Fantastic. Back at the Daily Planet, Clark is struggling with headaches and vision problems and runs into Lois, who is still cranky about Superman not giving her an interview. Hi. Clark points out that maybe Superman doesn't want to talk to her because he doesn't want all his secrets blasted on the front page of a newspaper. Yeah, but he doesn't know that's my plan. Why... why wouldn't he? I'd like to interview you for the Daily Planet! This does lead to a funny exchange, however. I'll be me, and you pretend to be Superman. Hello, Superman. Lois Lane, reporter for the Daily Planet. It's a ple- it's a ple- it's a pleasure, Miss Lane. And not only is this funny, but it actually gives a small but meaningful bit of character for Clark, who at first when addressed as Superman, automatically slips into using a much more confident voice before correcting himself back to his more natural cadence. It's good stuff. We then get a scene where Lois gets weirdly personal about why she wants to speak to Superman, as if she's directly talking to him, which in turn causes Clark to declare that he would do anything for Lois. Like, that's literally all he says. What do you say? If it was within my power, I would do anything for you, Lois. We'll see how easy that was! Listen, I'm counting the dokies for a reason, but we'll get there eventually. For now, just... Just keep in mind this number down here, as well as how I have so far described every instance of romantic interaction with these two without glossing over what is actually said. Anyway, Jimmy's yelling from their not office interrupts them, and they go to find out what's going on, only to run into... Oh no. <laughs> the absolute worst or jawsome laugh I have ever heard. Listen. Don't try and apply Japanese acting if you don't understand the culture of where it comes from and you only know it from anime. D don't, don't do that. Anyway, these bozos are some of the star reporters for the Daily Planet, namely Sport, Human Interest aka Gossip, and Investigative Journalist Ronnie. There is almost a joke in there. I am Chrysanthemum, this is the BJ Queen. This is John Crock. What's up, man? Anyway, they're here to take the conspiracy board because they've been assigned to the Superman story. And I didn't write this into the script because it only hit me now, but why is the sports journalist writing about the Superman story? Anyway, mainly, Perry wants quote-unquote real reporters to be working on Superman. Lois says they wrote a perfect report on Superman, so at least I know the trio do actually do some writing at some point, we just never see it. This doesn't slow Lois down, as she just becomes even more hyped by the concept of beating the reporters at getting a good story. Jimmy goes along because he can use the footage for his YouTube channel. Clark once again suggests they focus on something else, but they are all interrupted by a headline in the newsroom about the three stooges breaking out of jail. Jimmy immediately identifies it as the same tech Livewire was using. And Clark both homes in on the fact that more tech like this is going to cause a lot of damage, as well as uses the opportunity to focus Lois' energy on covering this story instead of Superman. Surprisingly, she agrees. All right. We briefly cut to these three yahoos again so we can learn they have a freeze ray with a faulty on and off switch. Also, the show freezes and unfreezes a fish specifically so we can see it's non-lethal. Back with the gang, Clark is unsure how they're supposed to get access to anything as three interns. Lois reveals she stole the other reporters' press badges and she expects them to lie to the warden about who they are, much to Clark's disgust. Lois pressures him into it by saying they can always go back to the Daily Planet and brainstorm ideas on how to interview Superman, so he relents. <laughs> No. We also use the time to further paint the new bad guys who I can finally start referring to as the Intergang as incompetent morons. Stop using our real names! Wait, is that a camera? And they are bad at it. 
listen, I'm not against making a gang of small time crook morons so you can emphasize what a horrifically bad idea it is to give them overpowered tech. I understand the concept of giving a toddler a gun. It's just the way the episode has structured this is mostly doing the job of defusing how seriously we should be taking this volatile situation. The idea is solid, the execution is just weak. Clark and the gang get caught as not actually being reporters and they make a break for it. But on their way to the exit, they somehow pass the crime scene and Lois reveals she swiped the warden's keycard as we start experiencing performance issues causing some bad frame rate. <laughs> Wait a minute. Was that a smile? No, of course not. The script dictates Clark finds this act of theft amusing this time because these two characters are doomed by the narrative to end up together. They find a piece of paper with some times written on it, but before they can figure out what it means, the warden shows up with security, so they escape the same way the intergang went. I could complain about the logic of this, but I don't actually care enough to do so. Jimmy reveals the back of the poster in the cell had a bank layout drawn on it, and they very quickly put together they're hitting the biggest bank in the city within the next 15 minutes, which we then cut to. The intergang frees everyone and break open the safe but fail to actually come across as particularly dangerous. The gang show up and Clark tells Lois and Jimmy to wait while he calls the cops. And Lois agrees, saying she and Jimmy will go get captured much to Clark's horror. Turns out she's been lying to Clark this whole time and had planned from the beginning to get taken hostage to force Superman to show himself so she can interview him. She didn't tell Clark because she knows he doesn't like the Superman interview story. This was your plan the whole time? To find trouble then ambush Superman when he flies in? I mean, it worked when we did it with Livewire. You did that on purpose? I'm just learning all kinds of interesting character traits about Lois in this episode. And before you ask why I'm criticizing the female character but not Jibby, please, who do you think planned the Livewire thing? Look me in the eye and tell me who you think would be responsible for that. Then a wall of ice shoots out of the bank and Clark pushes Jimmy and Lois out of the way and gets separated from them. He takes the opportunity to quick change into Superman and tells Jimmy and Lois to fuck off before he goes to confront the intergang. I do actually like that as soon as he enters the bank, he takes a second to look around and his very first demand is for the gang to unfreeze the civilians. I like that the show continuously shows that Superman's main focus is always on helping people first and foremost. Banshee yells no and they fight. Mist almost hits Rough House with the ice cannon and tries to turn it off but it's jammed again. Rough House moves to punch it the way he did earlier but this time he's wearing his power gloves. This causes the cannon to shatter and the crystal powering it to go berserk and freeze not just the entire bank but start freezing the area around it as well. Lois, realizing how out of control this is getting, instructs Jimmy to help people get out of the area while they try and find Clark. I do appreciate, despite how much she walks all over him, Lois is repeatedly shown as being genuinely concerned about Clark when they're not sure if he's okay. It's more than we usually get in shows like this, mostly because superhero shows disregard that that would be a serious concern for the characters who don't know their friend is a superhero. In older Superman content, the characters always seem annoyed when Clark misses all the action. So I like the far more realistic approach here, where they worry Clark might be in the same danger as the civilians and actually have his friends, you know, care about him. Back in the bank, Superman is struggling against getting frozen solid and his weird sight problems kick in again, which is revealed to be his X-ray vision developing. It allows him to see Lois and Jimmy try and direct the people outside the bank away from the danger. But seeing them get dangerously close to being frozen as well, Clark's desperation to protect them causes his powers to spike again, and he blasts free of the ice using his… is this heat vision or laser vision? I was never clear on which one Superman has, or if he has both, or if there's even a difference. Anyway. Clark blasts the jewel, ending the ice storm, and the resulting explosion activates a vision of the robots from episode 1 marching through a field firing their weapons. Luckily, destroying the power gem causes the ice to melt. Somehow. I don't really care. Superman takes the opportunity to smash Banshee's mask, which powers her voice, and then directs the EMTs to the people who were hit the hardest. We see Deathstroke 
feels weird calling him that. We see Raiden in disguise and it's clear he's gonna kidnap the Intergang the same way he kidnapped Livewire. Superman flies over to Jimmy and Lois and again, to Lois's great credit, she anxiously runs over to Superman for help because they can't find Clark. Superman tells her he's okay because he saw Clark phoning for help when he flew over. He then offers to give Lois her interview and, seeing the other reporters run over to him, picks her up and flies her away so they can talk somewhere private. Hi. We get the first flight scene, which I don't know if that's a Superman story staple, but I feel like it should be. Or maybe the 70s movie just had such a big impact on pop culture that I think it's a staple. Superman drops Lois off on top of a building, which I am making the time to say because the brief moment of animation where she's a little off balance is actually extremely well done and it made me happy to look at. Lois asks him why he finally agreed to be interviewed and he says because when he told Jimmy and Lois to get to safety, they instead stayed behind to help other people. Fair enough. Anyway, the interview, although not directly portrayed as such in the show itself, is kind of a disaster. Where do you come from? I don't know. How do your powers work? I'm still figuring that out. Who are you? What are you? I'm kind of figuring that out too. Miss Lane, the truth is I'm still piecing together who I am and what I can do. He then flies off, telling her that the point is he's here to help, and then he quick changes into Clark, almost forgetting to change his hair so he can act concerned about where Lois went. She's relieved to see him and apologizes both for lying to him about her plan as well as for putting him in danger. But he brushes her off and tells her lying to him and putting him in potential danger is okay because getting an interview with Superman meant a lot to her. Lois tells him she actually just got her interview and Clark has to pretend to be shocked, which is actually really funny. He sheepishly asks her what she thought of Superman and she scoffs saying that Superman is clearly a liar, much to Clark's confused horror as the episode ends. Oh, also, I haven't mentioned it much, but the photos in the ending credits change depending on the episode. It's not meaningful or anything, it's just a cute detail. And that's it for the first three episodes. So far, this show is a real mixed bag. Compared to Velma and High Guardian Spice, it is a masterpiece, don't get me wrong. The show is obviously very devoted to getting Clark and Superman right. And from what I have seen from this show's reception, most Superman fans are more than relieved to have a version of Superman that once again focuses on optimism, helping people and being a good person. As I already said, I also like that this show puts Clark forward first and foremost before his disguise as Superman. And although the differences are more subtle than in previous versions, there is still enough difference that it's distinct between who Clark is and who Superman is. Besides, I think the existence of Tony Hawk proves once and for all that nobody would be able to recognize Clark as being Superman. But yesterday someone said, um, uh, you know, does anyone ever tell you you look like Tony Hawk? I said, yes. And then that's the end of the conversation. Lois is a fun character and I do like the angle of making her more energetic and unhinged than in previous versions, specifically because she is an intern looking for her big break. It not only contextualizes why she's this hellbent on the Superman story, but also makes most of her reckless decisions believable. The show also makes an effort to make her acknowledge and apologize when she lets her ambition get the better of her and make mistakes as well as having the confidence to allow Lois to make mistakes and directly classify those actions as wrong. I sure hope nothing happens in the future to change this. Jimmy is pretty fun, but I am a little torn on his character. On the one hand, I think I prefer this interpretation of him compared to most of the older versions. I like that he's ridiculous and a dweeb who nobody takes seriously rather than a doormat who acts like a little boy who's wandered into the newsroom rather than a literal adult with a job. I also appreciate the joke that every insane conspiracy theory he spouts in the show is actually something that is 100% actually correct in the DC universe. I don't catch all the references myself because this show is smart enough not to call attention to it, but I know enough to know the concept itself is hilarious. And it's a way to do referential humor and fan service in a good way. However, what bothers me about Jimmy is that he's written to be, 
well, fan fiction soccer. really tired of seeing fanfiction soccer show up in cartoons written by people who really liked Avatar The Last Airbender. So, Sokka is a great character. I'm not super into Avatar myself, but Sokka is probably my favorite character in the show. I have a soft spot for a cringe fail nerd with a sardonic sense of humor with a slight cynical streak. However, Sokka is not just a cringe fail nerd with a sardonic sense of humor. Sokka, like most characters in Avatar, has actual depth to why his character is written the way he is. His sardonic sense of humor, sarcasm, and relatively cynical outlook comes from the fact that he's old enough to remember the raids on his village, and he is most aware out of all the lead characters apart from Zuko just how dangerous the Fire Nation actually is. But because he's a teenager with a squeaky voice, he is also used to people ignoring him or at least disregarding his input, which is why most of his objections he voices in the form of sarcasm, because he already knows he's not going to be taken seriously, but he still feels the obligation to voice his concerns because somebody has to. But Sokka is also not always the comedy relief. He has his fair share of moments that are far more serious. His self-confidence issues first manifesting as being too young to fight with his father but old enough to grasp the situation and continuing through the series as the only member of the main group who has zero bending powers. The show however gives him ample opportunity to show that Sokka isn't just some clown but is probably the smartest member of the group both in terms of strategizing as well as having a knack for engineering and being a very skilled warrior. Part of Sokka's character arc is to grow out of the immature comedic relief who is just a tag-along and into the adept strategist who can figure out how to outmaneuver his opponents intellectually. That's Sokka's character. But that's not the character of fanfic Sokka. Fanfic Sokka is the way people who did not work on Avatar tend to write Sokka which is to massively flanderize him into the goofy comedic relief character who is overly enthusiastic about things to a degree kids would refer to as cringe and who is severely behind the main characters in terms of strength and power, but who is genuinely described as smart. It's soccer if you sanded off all the nuance and character depth and only left the broadest of characteristics because you are only interested in soccer as a support beam for the characters you are actually interested in writing, which most often tend to be the characters you want to ship. And fanfic soccer has started popping up in these kinds of cartoons more and more. There was Lance in Voltron, there was Bo in She-Ra, and now we have Jimmy in this show. And before you think this is a reach on my part... <laughs> Jimmy reminds me of Sokka from Avatar. <laughs> yeah. So although I like Jimmy's character in concept, the way he is written also annoys me. Please write a character who isn't just a fanfic version of Sokka. Also, maybe I'm overthinking this, but maybe stop making this character always be the one with the darker skin tone in the group. Just because I like these characters doesn't mean I don't see a pattern. Is it just me? Is anybody else seeing this? Am I insane? About this, specifically, I mean. <laughs> anyway, I like Jimmy, but he also annoys the hell out of me. Overall, the writing has been inconsistent in quality. Episodes will have a solid concept behind them and generally do a passable job at nailing the most important parts of an episode's plot, but the smaller bits and pieces that make up an episode's story are very weak. It feels like someone who was good at writing came up with the episode concepts and then the person who had to sit down and write out the concept into an actual episode didn't really know how to deliver that concept to its full potential. Or was just as interested in some parts of the plot so they would half ass it so they could get to the parts they actually wanted to write. At other points, things seem to happen because the story requires them to happen. And so they happen regardless of how little sense they make. This happens both in things the characters actively do and react to, as well as things they say to each other and how they interact. There are shakeups to the status quo in this show I think can lead to some really interesting and juicy character writing, 
mostly involving Superman's inability to communicate with Jor-El and how this changes everything about how Superman functions psychologically. They didn't even have to make Jor-El secretly be evil or that he was the one who blew up Krypton or something. All they did was break the translator and then sat back and let the fallout from that one change happen to the characters. It's genuinely impressive writing. But then you have things like the most ribrate cracker villain design made all the more insulting by what they originally looked like in comparison. As well as a lot, and I mean a lot of sloppy storyboarding work, as well as animation mistakes or just subpar work. Again, I don't know if this was due to time crunch or not. So far, the show gets Superman right, but man, it could have used a fourth or fifth writing draft. And that's it for part one. Apparently YouTube is putting out a new feature where if you actually say the words hit the subscribe button, it makes the actual subscribe button do some dopamine sparkles. So this is me saying hit the subscribe button because I'm genuinely curious if that works. Or I might have just misunderstood it and they mean that if you actually click the subscribe button it sparkles, but I, I think it's if you actually say it out loud. I don't know, let me know. Also, sorry this video took so long. I was hired on a short project which had some sakuga, which ate up a lot of my time. But I'm hoping to get to these videos a little faster again. Um, anyway, I'm off to do other things now, I guess. Special thanks to top patron supporters Trey Windenol, Fulong Cool, Catharsis939, and me and my gaster and thank you to all patrons as well as channel members for supporting my content i don't like that whole going back in time thing why not what's the point of anything if you can just go back in time and fix any problem please get a job you do what you do i'll do what i do can't wait to hear that surround what's going on back there this one's different than mine you go back in time and read the instructions <laughs> oh. Sorry.